Hey guys, Ben Ostervelt here with the Business From Within podcast. Okay, awesome. We got Steve Sims here. So, hey man, thanks for uh, jumping on the show. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you know what's funny? The other day, my had your book sitting on my counter and uh, thinking I should probably read this book if I'm going to be talking to you. And, and I haven't totally, but I've got some really good bits and pieces out of it. I don't know how to read that well, to be honest. But uh, my wife found it, as you know, and it was kind of like, I'm like, where's my book? And she's sitting there reading it. I sent you a picture. Anyway, she's all over this thing now. She's like, she, she wants to uh, be good friends and everything. I'm like, look, Renee, this is, this is my friend. And I said, you, you can't just jump in like that. So anyways, no, really cool. It's cool to see. Actually, really cool to see how my wife grabbed on that. But anyways, let me introduce you. I've got, uh, uh, just in case there's one more person in the world that doesn't know you. I know there's, uh, actually, to be honest with you, when, I'm, when I saw you on Facebook and you posted the, the, the comment that kind of drew me into you that said, hey, I'm at the Grammys. Uh, if only, just don't forget, there's 30 years behind me with some dark days. Oh, the Oscars. The Oscars, sorry, sorry. And, and you're at the Oscars, and <laughs> that shows what I know. But at the Oscars, and, and uh, that point really hit me. And I'm putting this podcast together, and I'm thinking, I'd love to talk about that. And uh, that's why you're here. So what I want to do is I want to just introduce Steve. Steve Sims is a whiskey-drinking biker from South London, who hates the word authenticity, but loves transparency. He's a highly educated, he's he's highly educated with a doctorate in street who truly makes the impossible happen. He has blown the minds of the rich and famous to the point Forbes calls him the modern day wizard of Oz. He is a father of two boys, one girl, and he has a wife named Claire who has stepped, has, has been by his side every step of the way to the top. He is not, the thing is, I'm sorry, sorry, at the top, that was really good, eh? Let's try this again. That was pretty good. Keep going, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep going. No problem, right? Uh, so he's a father of two boys. With his, so his wife, who has been with him from the journey from the bottom to the top, where he is not just playing, but totally winning. But it is not, it is not always been hanging out with Elton John, pulling off deep dives to the sunken Titanic, or arranging Andre Bocelli to serenade his clients at the feet of the statue of David. There have also been dark days, self-doubt, and a lot of mistakes along the way. Today, Steve is here to talk about his journey, and but just to remember, the amount of respect deserved for what he's doing is super high. But you know what? It, the real life lessons are in the dark days. So the people that want to be impacted, and that's why we're here. It's not to the, everyone in podcasts are levering the shit out of everybody, trying to get more viewers. The number one thing is if there was one person that just actually had a shift is the most important thing. And so that's what we're here today to talk about. So on a high note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's not a, uh, a big demand. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I just, I just think when you were standing there in uh, the Grammys and you, and you posted that, what was what was the picture like? What was the what was these dark days that you were talking about? Like, was there a oh, picture right. in your head? Um, it was. Um, I don't want to keep correcting you, but it was the Oscars. Um, shit, shit, man. No, was, go ahead. Uh, sorry. No, no, no. no. It was. <laughs> so it sorry. was funny that um, this has been this has been my. Um, I've been with working with Elton John's group for I don't know eight years or something, and I've been official with him for like three or four. And you know, I go to his party every year. And it's, it's really cool. Uh, and it's for a phenomenal cause. And you get all these pictures of everyone in an insta-perfect world. And, you know, you're there and, you know, you, you're there with Steven Tyler and you're there with Elton John. You're there with uh, Miley Cyrus turned up this year. And there's a whole bunch of people, Sharon Stone, Madonna, the whole world descends on, uh, on Elton's party. And you look shit on. You look absolutely amazing for about four hours of your life on a Sunday night when you're, when you're at this Oscar party. But no one actually sees the pain that it took to get to that position. Yeah. And I would love to be able to tell you that uh, um, I was the one that came up with that, uh, that um, ice, ice cap or the, the tip of the iceberg kind of concept. Mm -hmm. But, um, and you mentioned I'm an educated man. I am. Um, but school had nothing to do with it. Yeah. It was a few years ago that I was, uh, again, at Elton's party. All the celebrities are waiting to line up to go down the white, white carpet and get that photograph taken by all the magazines. Um, and in front of me was Steven Tyler. 
and Steven Tyler is just one of the coolest cats in the planet. Hands down, simple cool. as that. Cool. And I'm chatting with him just before we actually go down the carpet, and they stagger you. It's very funny when you look behind the scenes of these things, but they stagger you. And if there's two actors, they may slot a musician in the middle so that it's not... <laughs> So they, they, they do all this That's shit. Cool. So Stephen was about to go down there, and I just made a quip about, oh, it's pretty cool to be walking down the carpet, isn't it? And he turned around and he said, everyone's going to see me walking down a 15-foot carpet now. No one saw the miles that mm. it took me to crawl to get here. It's beautiful. And yeah. I just thought, damn. So no one ever sees it. No one ever sees so the shit. So you're, you're, you're saying I'm interviewing the wrong guy. Yeah, you've always been a beautiful guy. So, I, am, I am a big deal to, you, you mentioned about, you know, <laughs> don't know me. That's pretty much 99.9.5% of the world um, doesn't know me. Yeah, exactly. But I'm a big deal in that top 5%. I'm the yeah. guy that some of the uh, people, and it always makes me laugh because everyone says, oh, I work for the rich and famous. I work for the richer and unknown. I work yeah. for people that own countries, that own banks, that, that own governments. Um, I'm the guy that they call in to get done. You know, someone called me the real life Wizard of Oz. I had another guy said that I was the nice version of Ray Donovan. So I'm the guy you call just to get shit done. When the book came out, it suddenly thrust me into a much wider net. So quite simply, a lot of people don't know what I do, but they've never seen, and no one ever does on your Instagram or your Facebook, where you can't sleep on a Tuesday night because you mm. can't make payroll or you yeah. can't pay for the kids' education or you can't pay the rent or you can't pay the mortgage or you've got this debt or some, someone's left your company and stole all your clients or someone's used your name and it, that person's now suing you. Mm. you know, just, no one gets to see yeah. all that shit. Yeah. And I think, I think now in a world where we've got these insta-perfect worlds, we need to step back and go, hey, congratulations for being there. What shit did you go through totally. to get there? So exactly. that you can quite simply help others get to your same position. Yeah, it's, 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 I see every day uh, the new word entrepreneur, uh, coach. Uh, like it's, I think coach is going to change to mentor, and it's just all semantics. It's, all like, it's almost like someone finds new white space strategically, not because of passion or any kind of thing. What's your opinion on that? You open up Instagram and Facebook and every second one that pops up is a fucking entrepreneur. Like, what's so, your thoughts on that? So is in the 80s, cool? in the 80s, if you were an entrepreneur, it meant that you couldn't get a job. You know, <laughs> yeah. an entrepreneur yeah. in the 80s was a disgusting title. Um, I never knew what it was. Um, most entrepreneurs don't become entrepreneurs. They're born entrepreneurs. Totally, and yeah. it's just something where they realize they don't fit. And if they're lucky, they fit in a space that makes them very successful. But you're right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of trend appeal at the mm -hmm. moment. And yeah. I remember going on stage because the one thing that absolutely pissed me off was all of these speakers, authors, mentors, coaches, they all come forward. And we see it so much now. So you've only got to watch the bloody voice or any of these kind of music games. Yeah. They don't go on there and talk about their voice and they want to, they talk about, I'm doing this for my dad because he lost his mm. left ear, you mm. know? And it's, just a, it's a fucking sob story, yeah. you know? Yeah. Everybody's got a freaking sob story, <laughs> you know? I just want everyone to get off that little sub box and just go, everyone's been screwed over. Totally. If, if you haven't been screwed over, ripped off, slandered, had a lawsuit, damn near gone broke, gone broke, and you're an mm. entrepreneur, then it's just a matter of time matter before of time. all of that happens to you. So yeah. I don't want it. So I remember going up on stage once and I'm the guy that gets shit done. And I've got my own stories, but those are the educations that have got me to where I am. I look at them differently. And I went up on stage and I remember doing this speech and I said, I'm not up here because I had a car crash or I lost me, I lost me left testicle in, a, <laughs> in an accident or, you know, I did. And I gave this little stream of things that had never happened to me. And I got off and this guy behind the curtain who was going on speaking next was like, yeah, that was good, Steve. And I just thought, you know, fuck's wrong with him? And he went up on stage and as I was walking out, there was a friend of mine, I'm not gonna mention it, but he came over and just started tearing down because the guy's opening line oh, was no. about how he was in a car crash. <laughs> no, like, oh. no way. 
everyone's using these dark moments as a, a badge of honor. Yeah. And the bottom line of it is, everyone's got the same badge of honor. You've all got yeah. your shit, you've all been through it. And because I'm lucky to, to knock around in the worlds of the, the, the Elons, the Peter Diamandis, the, uh, the, the Bransons, the Jean-Paul de Joria, you know, all of these people, they've all got that crap. Yeah. And they've all used it in order to get to the next level. Because my dad once said to me that no one ever drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. There's nothing more empowering than getting up from a smack in the head and going, well, that didn't knock me out. You know, I'm that, stood up again. That, and that's the difference though, right? It's the guys that get up. That's entrepreneurial. It doesn't matter. You just, yeah. do it. it's not, it's, yeah, not a, it's like you got, you got 10 steps. I don't care what happens. It's happening. Like it's just not an option, right? You just wake up in the morning. It's going to get done. People are going, Oh, you're so it's lucky. I'm not lucky. I just get it done. Like, yeah, how do you, you do it? I don't know. I just get it done. Like it just, I think that's entrepreneurial. Yeah. You made a decision and everyone has, it's the only thing that you have in life where you really are in charge of that decision. But when the shit happens to you, you have a decision. And that decision is, do you allow it to define you or do you allow it to refine you? That's the thing. And those people that go, oh, my life's over. I've just lost no. this. They've used it to define them. Those people that have no, gone, exactly. shit, how did I get into that mess? I want to stare at it, acknowledge it and go, right, okay. Because you very, 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 very rarely, if ever, fall over the same way twice. And I think you nailed it there. And I think it's more of a psychological thing is, is how do you get over this bullshit that we've go through? Like I've, I got my stories, you got your stories, but it does define me in it, but it, in, in a way where it actually fuels me. And I actually want to, once you know pain, then you really, it's almost like you, you want meaning for your business. It's not helping uh, an orphanage. And I know it is, but you know what I mean? It's not a public thing where I'm like, Hey, I've got an orphanage, 10% of my money go. No, no. I'm talking about the pain I went through. I know. And I know yep. that's, and I'm, I'm assuming that's similar to you. And that drives you that there's something when you, you can see people for who they are, which you got to figure out your shit. You know what I yeah. mean? Do you remember old uh, um, Mike Tyson who uh, you don't look at Mike Tyson as a, as a mentor or guru or motivational speaker, uh, although, although he actually is. Um, I remember him saying, everyone's got a plan until they get a smack in the face. Um, and that's exactly what it is. You know, totally. if everyone, that's why I don't do business plans. Business plans are where you write down bullshit and then actually think is going to happen because no one has ever written a bullshit, uh, ever written a business plan where they, they outline in, in uh, year three exactly. where they either get screwed over, go bankrupt. They don't put that in there. It's all kind of like, and <laughs> yeah. then this unicorn came in and gave me coffee that morning. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Business plans are full of crap. And no, they're, the best know, ones are sitting on the shelves with dust on them. That's what I say. Oh yeah. 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 The, guy, you know, the, guy, I, the guy making the money is the guy teaching it, teaching the yeah. business plan. Yeah. Do it, do it, do it right. If you're going to do something, write it on a stamp. Someone actually taught me this. If you've got a great idea, write it on a stamp because you learn brevity, you learn focus and then just action, whatever you've written on that stamp. Yeah. And, and so and, that's the business yeah. plan. In, and I find if we, the way I set goals, I don't know if you, how, how I'm not really into even talking about setting goals, but I, I, we said, I set a target, you know, and then burn them and then go toward it. And cause it, you, you, how do you, how do you even know? But what you said there was really interesting about, about how you look, you look at it square in the face, the bullshit. You know what I mean? I think that's actually, a, you could be a psychologist if you just literally do that. If you can just get to know that bullshit, look at the stuff, look at the pain, look at all the abuse, look at just look right at it. Look, so many people run from it. It turns into self sabotages. It's a business from within concept. Is that all that shit is still haunting you? And if you like, it's it's not about getting rid of it. It's about getting to know it. And I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, it is. But you just said it more eloquent. <laughs> well, I got lucky there. Nice. <laughs> you know what? I kind of want to get to know you, Steve. I I, I feel like. Uh, uh, to be bluntly honest, I listened to a few podcasts. First time I, I got to know you through the three podcasts I listened to, cause I, but it was literally just more of a gut thing. I thought I'd just call Steve and say, you want to be on my show? Was, I, I don't have some big master plan. I uh, just totally put myself out there and uh, doing what I feel I should. But I want to get to know you. I've come up with a few questions. And uh, okay. because I think a lot of people know Steve Sims as, uh, well, actually, you know, it's funny here. You'll think this is funny or maybe not. I don't know you yet. But the thing is, I typed in just Steve Sims to see what Google searches. Do you know what people are searching on you? I thought was so ridiculous. No. Net worth. 
it came up. I'm like, Steve Sins, one of the top one is fucking net worth. I'm thinking, what's wrong with our society? Like, this, 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 I'm sure you live and breathe and see this, but it's like, is that what I want to know? The first thing I want to know about Steve Sins is that I, I don't care. I really don't care. Like I don't, I doesn't, I want to know who you are as a human being, but is that what's, what does that tell us about society and, well, and, and what's your have, reaction uh, to that? We have a, uh, we have a policy within my company and I own uh, the company that really kind of got me to where I am now is a luxury concierge firm. And we charge membership to become uh, into the family. And it's $5,000 to get our phone number. Um, and what we, do, what we do is we say very clearly that when someone applies, you are to set up a meeting to have a call with them to discuss their needs, desires, things like that. You are not to Google them. So we don't allow Beautiful. any of our team to Google because I don't want to see what you want me to see or what someone else wants me to see. I want my gut reaction as to whether or not you know, you're a decent person. So we've ended up with clients that we've known for like six months to suddenly discover what they're up to and where they are and you know, what they own and just gone, holy crap, you know? Yeah, I, that's I, awesome. I can, watch, yeah. I can watch the Oscars, I can watch um, uh, any of the big events, the sporting events, I can watch any of these things, motor racing events, and just go, oh, there's my client, oh, there's my client, oh, there's my client, oh, there's a client, yeah, yeah. you know? So and, are, you, um, are you proud? Just fine. It must Sorry? be it must like it must make you proud to sit back and be like, okay, cool. You did something cool. Like you don't have to tell anyone, but there's almost sometimes I feel like we miss that moment to be like, good fucking job. I'm actually proud that I'm living at my terms. Um, I love the fact that my clients aren't mentioned. Everyone knows a lot of the relationships that I have, but you don't know the clients that I have. Um, and I've got to this this position in my life not by trying to be somebody else. I'm still, the, yeah. I'm still the whiskey drinking boy from London that just wears a black t-shirt everywhere, period. And I just do what I do and it's my life. I'm not, I'm not using any effort whatsoever to try and uh, uh, look like someone pretty or smarter just to freaking impress you because I don't care. I either want you to resonate with me. I want, you, I want to either you know, have you resonate or repel. That's what I want, and I'm happy to live in that world. So when yeah. I do see the stuff that gets up, uh, when I do see, like, like this morning, there's a magazine called CEO World, um, and they wrote a big article on me today. And oh. I'm looking at it, and one of the pictures they use is me on a motorbike, and the other one's a picture of my dog. My dog, that picture was taken, I think, by the New York Times. They use that picture so many times now, and I often say that my dog has upstaged me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every single photo. <laughs> What's your uh, dog's name? Mac. And he's Mac? a massive, great, massive, great pit bull mix. Beautiful. So, uh, I, I was looking at it. I, I said so that's so cool. I think a lot of like, it's it, we have this weird, uh, you know, you put a suit on. I love your story uh, about the you, like um, the story how you used to go to parties. You put your, you grabbed your your beautiful car, you put your suit on, and then all of a sudden you were invisible. Yeah. Can you tell that yeah. story? I think it's powerful. Yeah, I was so let's let's back up and give a little bit of context to it. I was a doorman on a nightclub and it all started that, you know, I wanted to hang around with rich people. So the best way to hang around with anyone is to be of value. Um, so I started finding value for these people and what they needed to know was where was the best parties that night. Um and it grew from there. Now I was just a meathead on the front of the door, black t shirt, jeans, you know, with a black jacket on. But um then I started getting a decent Rolodex and quite simply started traveling around the world. And one day, and I don't know why it happened, but I had been doing this company for like about five years. We lived in a nice penthouse. Your life was good. Money was good. Uh, I was good. But like all entrepreneurs, when things really go well, what do we usually do? We do something to fuck it up. You got it. Yeah. And I started looking at it and going, ooh, you know, I better, I better adapt this. I better change that. You know, I, I better do and I came up with the incredible conclusion that I needed to change me, okay? Um, it, was like a, it was like Ferrari decided they were going to build cars without wheels. And did you just, just feel like you just feel like you were out of sorts there, like getting into this world? Did you feel like maybe your value was too low and you needed to, to prop it up with something external? Like what was going on? It was the visibility. I was turning up at so many events on a motorbike, in a black T-shirt and leather jacket. And one day I thought to myself, Ooh, I look odd. I stand mm. out. Um, and that can't be good. I don't know why, but I just came up with a conclusion. 
it can't be good. So I started buying suits and I started taking my earrings out and my brow piercings. And, you know, I started wearing jackets and uh, started driving a car. Um, and I spent so much effort in being someone who I wanted you to see. Mm -hmm. I actually run out of effort just to be me. Um, and so I noticed I was going to a lot of events and quite, as you said it quite openly, I went to a series of events between 96 and 97 that I never actually turned up at mm. because it was this persona. It was this puppet of who Steve Sims was. And I remember one day getting a picture back from a massive party I'd thrown in Monaco. And there's a picture of me doing my best Don Johnson in a suit, leaning up against a Ferrari. And I'm thinking, the bloody hell is that? That's not me. And it, it sent me into a spiral. So luckily, again, I had the great support of my wife, Claire, that you mentioned earlier. We went, hang on a minute, you know, if it wasn't broke, then what, what were we fixing? Um, and we went back. We got rid of the car. We piled the suits up and uh, went back to the motorbike. And suddenly I found I was engaged again because it takes zero effort to be you. Totally. And when there's no effort to be you, that means there's 100% effort in doing what you do. And that, that just seemed it's beautiful. brilliant. So I didn't need Elon Musk to calculate that that yeah. was a great formula. So that's what I started doing. I went back to being me. And now I travel around the planet. Uh, you will nine times. The only time I actually wear it, well, the only time I wear a tuxedo is Elton John's party. I noticed um, that. I noticed you were wearing a tux. I'm like, where's, where's Steve? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I, I love my little tux. You know, once <laughs> you know, it's dusted off and then I wear that. But no, I, I, I'm traveling around the world with uh, royalty and icons and I'm always in a black t-shirt and jeans. Beautiful. I think that's inspiring. It gives people permission. You know, I think that's, there's a weird thing that happens when, when you be you. And the more I be me, the more people have permission to be themselves. And that's unbelievably fulfilling. So do you yeah. feel like it's kind of cool? It's uh, you can almost do a whole talk on it, Steve. Sometime it's on the whole idea about being invisible by trying to be someone else, and the only way you can be seen is actually be yourself. And in this world, you know, like in your relationships with even your, your kids, your wife, and everything, I think it can, I think it can overlap all of that just from that story. I think it's uh, really impacting. You should do a keynote one day on being invisible. Anyways, yeah, no, it's uh, it's true. You'll notice a lot of people, and I find this funny. I work up in Silicon Valley a fair bit. And you go up in Silicon Valley and everyone thinks that the second that they've got a job in Silicon Valley, they've got to get a hoodie and a pair yeah. of pants. <laughs> totally. And they end up looking like every other prick. Exactly. Um, yet exactly. all of the people that started it, Steve Jobs never looked like anyone else before him. Um, Mark Zuckerberg never did. Exactly. Elon Musk never did. Richard Branson never did. You know, no one ever looked like anyone else. But all of these people now want to go, oh, yeah, I've got to totally. emulate this person. I've got a job in a bank. I've got to look like that person. Try looking like you. Totally. And so it, you know what? It's funny because everyone, you know, the think rich or what is it? Grow rich, think rich by yeah. Napoleon Hill. He, he came up with the word masterminds and now it's gone to another level. Like I'm looking at all these masterminds and I'm just like bewildered because everyone says, Oh, I've got to get the five best people in my life. Cause I'm going to be like them. And it's almost like we get lost in want to just be you. Like, it's almost like they, these masterminds have become this, this new way of being, it's like, it just apps. I have not signed up to anything. Only thing I'm in is Philip McKernan. That's not a mastermind. That's the, that's the challenge of living shit out of you to be what yourself. What the fuck are you doing with McKernan? <laughs> actually, uh, actually on that note, Steve, I actually asked, uh, I told Philip I was going to chat with you. He's got a question for you for this oh, show. Oh, great. Okay. Come Here on it is. Are you ready? It's, it's so kind. It's mm. so loving. He says, how can someone so unattractive, Make it in Hollywood. <laughs> and we'd like to hear the answer. <laughs> oh, I think it's because McKernan's not here. Um, oh, so God, he's, that, he's your greatest cool. threat. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a very strange individual. Um, he moved from Canada to uh, um, America, and I did everything to block that visa, but I, I failed abysmally, yeah, and he that was still ended up here. Yeah, oh, yeah, I was, I was starting communities and banners trying to block McKernan coming into the country. <laughs> But uh, I thought McKernan coming into America was a bigger threat than Trump. But um, he still made it. So we, we now have the quote for the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some questions at you to get to know you a little bit better. I think, I think it's great to hear, what, hear what's going on. I think it's like super cool what you're doing. Even Forbes called you a cool guy. And that's, you know, it's, it's kind of cool when Forbes calls you a cool guy. But I guess if you believe it, that's what matters. So now here's a question for you. If you go back in time, okay? 
from the day you were born mm -hmm. and you, you showed up in a time machine to talk to your parents as they held you as a baby, what advice would you give your parents? Oh, I wouldn't. When I was a young kid, I thought I was incredibly poor. It wasn't until I was in my late twenties that I was fortunate enough to realize how affluent I actually was. Um, we never went out to fancy meals. We never had a new car. We never had any of those things, but I learned, I learned morals. I learned core values. I learned to keep my word. If I said something out of place or inappropriate or rude, I got a smack in the, uh, smack in the mouth. I thought I lived in a very poor, rough family without realizing when I got older that I was in one of the richest families it ever could have been. And so don't change anything. In fact, bring some of those values into today's kids and stop pussyfooting around the little princesses. Totally, man. I got five kids, Steve. And it's a huge topic. You know, when you, we talk business and we coach people and there's all these different things you do and you're, you get really good at what you do and it becomes your persona. But really, it's crazy. We're both dads. And it's funny because if you get right to the heart of it, that's a very, very powerful energy that sits inside us when it comes to our kids. Absolutely. So, you know what I mean? Like, it's funny. That's who we really are. We're dads and husbands. And like, the, there's the business persona, which is definitely who we are. But there's a whole big part of us that's not on TV in a way. So if you, had to, if you had to build a school, okay, like I'm really interested in what you have to say about kids. And I think that a lot of people should be asking you way more questions about kids than just business. Just so you know. What, what, would you, what would you do if you had to build, build a school today for kids? So I can answer that question with uh, Larry Page. Do you, know, you know Larry Page, who uh, is the uh, founder of Google, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. There is a college in Silicon Valley called, well, it's not a college, it's a university, and it's called Singularity University. And it is founded by Ray Kurzweil, who mm -hmm. invented Siri, uh, Peter Diamandis, who is from the XPRIZE and the XPRIZE Foundation, uh, I think Elon Musk is part of it. Larry Page is definitely part of it. Basically, it's full of geniuses. Well, it's called Singularity University, but it is not a registered EDU. To become a registered EDU in America, you've got to provide a curriculum that will last for 10 years. Larry Page is known for turning around and saying that nothing we know today will be relevant or applicable within two years, let alone 10 years. So it's the only university that's not registered as an EDU. Interesting. So for me, if I was going to start a school, I, would teach, I wouldn't teach Pythagoras theorem. I wouldn't teach languages. I would teach something that's relevant today and change that curriculum as and when necessary and more than likely monthly. Very cool. You know what? It actually ties into part of your book that you wrote, Bluefish, uh, The Art of Making Things Happen, mm -hmm. is you talked about how your greatest fear, do you remember? You wrote the book. Let me see if you remember. You're, <laughs> you probably don't even remember. Eh? Probably not. <laughs> what the hell is my greatest fear? But the greatest fear is that you would stay the same over and over again. Oh, time. monotony. Yeah. Yeah. So it almost, it almost, I bet you there's some thoughts behind tying into school, your book, business. How is, how is that your greatest fear and why? Um, anything that stays still dies. Uh, it rots. It becomes stagnant. And we are, we are moving molecules. And if we stay still, then we lose, we lose muscle, we lose intelligence, we lose all of those things. So constantly push. Um, I'll go to a restaurant, and if it's a restaurant I'm always going to, I'll try an appetizer, which I've never had before. I'll try yeah. a dessert, I've never had, or even a drink, or sit at a different table. Yeah, I, I constantly grow. My biggest fear, and this is what drives me forward, most people, when they're frightened of something, it repels them. When I'm frightened of something, I attack it. And I'm frightened of staying still. So the way that I can attack staying still is by constantly moving, constantly going to different events, constantly meeting, like McKernan, and I'm, I'll pick on him for an argument's sake, okay? Meeting people who have a different style, a different perspective, and challenging them, confronting them and asking them, yeah. well, why is that important to you? And doing it with many, 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 many people so that you grow and that's my importance, to, to, to run away from being stagnant. Yeah, it's beautiful. It just reminds me of, a, I had a meeting with a guy. He's got a, a big tech company here in, uh, in Canada. He's, he's uh, big into astrology and things. And we just had a meeting. We just kind of one of those connections. And, uh, and I just kind of challenged him on a couple of things. And I asked him, I said, hey, who challenges you? And he's like, oh, it's almost like, but he's been coaching. He's been doing personal development. And oh, <laughs> Hang up. Yeah. Get the headset out. Yeah, no worries. And and so so I was chatting with him and I just asked who challenges you? 
And it was almost like a bit of like bewilderment and eating candy at the same time. Like, hmm. So we're going out and just, I just thought, let's go for coffee. And it just, one of those things, he's, he's, he probably got a lot of people around him that think he's something really special. And I just was just looking at his heart. You know, I think like you said, and that's the thing with Philip. And, and I think that's one thing I actually wanted to bounce off you is you tell a story in your book about how you, when you, I don't know if when you began and I think you still do it now is you go to the highest end Ritz hotel and you say, Hey, uh, next time I'm staying here, I'd like to maybe look at your rooms. You get in, look at their top level, $2,000 night rooms. And you kind of imagine being there or whatever it is. But the thing is, the thing is that the point is that's a really cool law of attraction kind of like tactic. But what I'm interested in is what, who's Steve behind that thought, meaning you must see the limiting belief you have, because obviously you wouldn't have done that. Like you wanted to go see it. And I'm just wondering is, is you see it and then you know, this is the way through it. You almost, you almost, do you attack the things that hold you back in yourself? Um, or am I totally misreading this? I think I probably do now, but my biggest talent and my biggest gift I had that got me to where I was, was ignorance of the issue. Mm. So I saw people strolling around. I saw people strolling around with like, you know, $20,000 watches and $5,000 suits and a, you know, $100,000, $200,000 cars. And I would look at them and I'd go, well, why is that so fancy? You know, mm. and I could never... I could never understand it. And while other people would be intimidated by it, I would literally say to someone, that looks like an expensive watch. And you'd get people go, yes, this is a note of my PJ and it is, you know, $50,000. Have you ever noticed how many people actually tell you the price of things? Yeah, totally, man. So I've gone, okay, why is that worth $50,000? You know? Mm -hmm. and, and I've said this to people, you know, you're drinking a bottle of wine there, there's $400. Why is that better than my wine in a box? You mm -hmm. know? I want to be educated. I want, that's part of that growth thing. So yeah. I was very ignorant, but I was also the kid. And you know the American uh, story about the emperor's clothes or the yeah. king's clothes, and they're naked because only the most intelligent can see it. I'm that kid that just goes, why'd you do that? Why yeah. is that better? So, <laughs> I could imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as a little Irish yeah. kid growing up in London, um, I was constantly asking questions. I constantly wanted to know. I do it now. If I find someone says to me, no, you can't do that. All right. Why is that? Why? Yeah, why? You know, I want to know why. And I will, totally. I will badger it out to why until Love they it. hang up on me. And I've yeah. either asked the wrong person or the wrong question. So I will constantly ask why. So when I'm traveling and I see that, you know, I would travel in business class and I'd be like, I wonder what first class is up. I would get up and walk through the curtain. And of course, you'd quickly get someone to go, oh, sorry, so you got to go. Yeah, so yeah. I'd be like, so this is first class. All right, you know, I wonder, I, I don't think it's better than bit. And then I remember traveling first class. And I thought, What's I can't difference? see the point. <laughs> yes. um, and I remember, <laughs> I, you, I'm time, with you, man. I remember at the time um, that uh, I, I, I collect motorcycles, as you, know, you could already see. Um, yeah. And I remember saying to my wife, I'm going to go business class because the money I save, I can get a new engine rebuilt. And then I started doing that. So everywhere <laughs> that I traveled, I always calculated a first class and then would go for a cheaper economy, a premium economy, bit whatever, whatever yeah. just so I can make that saving so I could buy myself that my wife couldn't moan at me about. Nice, me. nice. No, I love, I, love, I love how simple and how genius the mixture is. You know what I mean? It's, I, think, I think people think being genius is actually being academically smart, but I actually think genius is being so simple and making sense of the things that are complicated. Like you just you oh, took something yeah. and just simplified it. And I, and I feel like I'm not smart and I feel like I get that communication. I'm like, oh yeah, that's, I get that. It's so simple. I've, I've you know. been in a room, I've been in a room with, with those geniuses and we do bandy that name around too much, yeah. but I've, been, I've literally been in a room of geniuses and they've explained time transference and they, they've, <laughs> Quantum explained, physics. they've explained yeah. um, uh, mineral mining on comets and they've explained all of these things to me <laughs> that I've understood. You know, I remember Ray Kurzweil, the, the guy that invented Siri talking to me about um, um, artificial intelligence and how it's actually you know, with a mind, and the big one, because he wrote the book Transcendent Man, that then years later got turned into that weird and wacky movie with the guy out of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Johnny Depp. Oh, yeah. Um, 
If you get the chance to watch Transcendent Man, the documentary of Ray Kurzweil, this was back in the 80s and 90s, when you didn't even know about this stuff, it will screw your head up. <laughs> Yet when you're talking to these guys, they can explain it to you. So smart people can explain things in a manner that someone yeah. else can understand. Someone that's pretending to smart to be smart cannot, and that's the real difference. Oh yeah, and it, and once you kind of once you kind of get comfortable with being who you are, you start hearing that, and it's almost like bad breath. You know, someone starts talking in big words. I just want to go, hey, dude, I don't know what you're saying. You, you're too fucking smart. Like, I just want to shut it down. I feel like that. You know, it just, it becomes yeah. that contrast, you know, because it's funny. I teach, I teach a lot of marketing and sales and a lot of real estate agents and things. And, and you hear the talk and it just, it, it just, it just to break it down. It's like, you know what? Here's how you do it. You, you, you find the problem, you solve the problem, you make the sale. And it's just like, I don't understand anything too complicated, but if you can bring it to a really simple place, I think actually that's what most people really want at a core level. Just, just give me the layman's terms, you know? Yeah, we've become, we've become too dramatic um, in, our, in our life now. We have overcomplicated things. And it's totally. ridiculous because the only thing, every, everything that you do today is changing how you get your coffee how your lights work how electric's coming to you how your food's being served how your food's being if you've ever gone to these meatless factories where they make burgers where they actually have <laughs> artificial meat everything that we're doing now from catching a cab to driving somewhere to eating a meal to have a everything's changing and you won't be able to recognize a lot of it mm. within two years let alone five or ten years but the one thing that won't change in the next 10 years is us. We're not going to get web feet. Yeah. We're not going to lose our fingers. We're not going to have a third eye. That's not going to change. The primitive things that we have, therefore, the need to fit, the need for companionship, totally. the need to be, have friends, to support mechanisms, our emotions, our relations, Connection. our senses. Yeah. All of those things haven't changed. It's totally the human. Yeah, everyone is going silly. And, and communication is one of the biggest downfalls Huge. at the Huge. moment with the modern community because they're learning the ability to communicate. And the only reason I am so damn good at communicating with the, the, the powerful, the rich around the planet is because everyone else is becoming so crap at it. Yeah, it's... <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you completely. I, 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 I uh, resonate. We don't have enough time to really deep down get to know each other, but I'm, I'm on the same, same wave. Like, I got a couple more questions for you to make this interesting. Go. What does it look like when Steve Sims is mad? Look, like real mad, real mad. Like, yeah. what does that look like? It's not good. Um, it's let's, get to know, we're... let's get to know the other side. <laughs> yeah. Well, Wait, funny. the reason why I ask you, ask you this is because I have this weird problem. I look at every human being and I go, wonder what, like, I know what happens when I, like, you don't lose control, man. Like, I'm talking like, I'm like, get mad, mad. Like, oh my God, there's frustrated different levels, right? But like, I look at every human being I meet, I go, what do they look like mad? Like, there's a, like, everyone's so perfect. I'm like, what happens? Because you see the nicest lady and you just think, what do they look like mad? It's just a weird thing I do. So I thought I'd ask. Yeah, nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, it's because of my family. Mm. You know, you get your maddest when it's when it's with those closest to you mm. so it'll be with your kids it'll be with your wife it'll be with your mum, your dad there's there's when you get your maddest is usually when someone's managed to get in you don't usually get mad with someone you don't connect with very yeah. well but you don't care so, about their opinion maybe you don't so that's that's when i get the maddest when i'm trying to do something with my family or with my kids and anyone out there that's got teenage kids is sitting there going, oh yeah, yeah, I got three kids and I openly <laughs> say I like two of them. And it depends on what yeah, day as to which two is it that I like. Um, yeah. But that's, that's, that's nine times out of 10. It's a very heated frustration I get on that, that final one out of 10 with people that fail to help themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you're working with someone, and I consult clients and I do speeches yeah. and I do consulting gigs as well, and you meet someone and you go, oh, hang on, so why are we doing that? Oh, it's always been done that way. Yeah, I hate that. Well, have you, have you ever had any success with it? No. Then why are we still doing it that way? Uh, we don't know. So should we change it? No, because that's how it's always been done. Forget that's it. where I go, 
Why am I here? Why and on here? top of it, the only thing that's been achieved is you've actually paid me to be here to, to completely ignore it. So oh, yeah. I get frustrated when people won't help themselves so in, get out of the hole. In that moment, like I've also done a lot of different coaching, consulting, like that's where the challenge comes in though. Like I think this is what I say, it's in, and this is about you, not just me, but, but just even just the concept of, like I risk the relationship every time I have a coaching client. Like it's not like when, when time comes, are we willing to risk that relationship to give that truth? It's not out of madness or anything. It's out of like, look, this can really help. You're not seeing it. You're playing the victim or whatever it is. I think sometimes it needs a little bit of a, a, a shock. Like, like, like some of the most successes I've ever had in coaching is through challenge. It's not encouragement. It's kind of, what do you think about that? Well, <laughs> for your, when you coach, yeah, so here's, here's my message to all coaches or mentors out there. You're not paid to be their fucking friend. And that's the problem. I find a lot, you know, if you want some companionship or some friend, you know, go to Amsterdam or something for the night. But mm -hmm. I well, find that a lot of these coaches, they, they turn up and they, they almost come along with that big puffy chest of, oh, yes, I worked for Google, I worked for them, I work, I'm a C, I was a... Former CEO, I've got captains of industries. Let me put my arm around you and impress you, and you can pay yeah. me at the same time. Gross. Gross. It's not for companionship. Coaches and mentors are not there for companionships. They're there to make that person better, more impactful, yeah. smoother, uh, more stress free. There's a job to do, but the job is not to become that friend. Now, if you become friend, hey, that's fantastic. That's bonus, but I yeah. actually I actually tend to find that I'm there, and I've said it many times, I'm there to make your business better. I'm there to make you better. I'm yeah. made, there to make you more effective. If we end up with a long-term relationship, that's great. But if what you're doing stinks, I'm there to tell you. Yeah, and that's, that's what that's coaches legit. have to do. It's amazing. It's amazing. People have come and said, hey, so on the, exactly what you're saying, some people have I've coached have had said, you know, I've had this coach, this coach, this coach. He goes, I want to hire you because you actually are honest with me. And it's, it's almost like the coach is a sales guy versus actually a coach. I think this whole industry is just so watered down. Are you seeing the same thing, Steve? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of coaches out there that are actually doing this job to get a bigger house. Yeah. Um, so I, I always look, I've always told myself, when someone says something to me, look at the source first. Um, mm -hmm. And you've got a lot of people out there. The, the ones that really make me laugh, and this is where I know I'm going to be pissing off people, and I don't care. You get these people that come out and they're international. This is one other thing international coaches to the rich and famous. Oh, they, okay, is it on their business card? Is that legit oh, what they say? I, I've heard it many, many times. To the, the rich and I famous, heard, it's called yeah. oh, a better niche something. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that one. Yeah, and then the other ones I've heard are like super connectors and things like that. And they're coming to you as a paycheck and they're yeah. coming to you and they're looking at you and they're going, Okay, how many? How many months of revenue can I get out of you before oh, I've got to pick you so back gross. to somebody else? And I did a, uh, and I'm not pitching this, um, mm -hmm. I did a program that's a $500 30-minute phone call. We'll jump on the phone, 30 minutes, 500 bucks, we're going to answer any question you like, okay? Yeah. And that was it. And that's been doing really, really well for me. Yeah. Sometimes it's I'll go simple again though. It's genius. Simple. Like it's just that colliding of like, it's, it's like the bricklayer's mind. You know what I mean? It's it, beautiful. It I, I'm not joking. There's no retention. You can't, you can't say, Hey, I want to buy five phone calls and do I get a discount? No, <laughs> you buy them one at a time and that's it. And so super I, simple and easy. And no, no, no real admin either. Super. Get on a call. I, I try to build my business around that as well. Like I'm not even hooking up these mics and everything like that. I'm already angry. Like I just, can someone just put this together for me? I'll just walk in here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think, I think we'd relate. So a couple, a couple more questions to keep on this. If I was to ask your wife who you were, who is Steve Sims from your wife's perspective? What would she say? Uh, boring, frantic, um, colorful, um, I would hope that she would put dedicated and loyal in those statements, but, um, I'm like every other entrepreneur. I am a, a, a helter skelter. I mm -hmm. am a, uh, I am a fairground ride that's up and down million times a day. And depending on what time of the day she catches me depends on what, on how she actually responds to me. But like all entrepreneurs, we are, we're uh, uh, up and down at best. So why does she like you? 
Why she stick with you, Steve? Um, I think what well, we met when we were kids. Um, you said nothing off limits. I just for the record, I emailed you and said, "Is there anything off limits?" Yeah, oh, nothing off okay. limits. Okay. Um, good. We we met when we were really young, and we were both kind of searchers. Um, she was a lot more conservative than me. I was a lot more jumping with both feet, um, even when the pool had no water in it. So both of the both of us were on the opposite spectrum of each other's personality. I think we I pulled her to do more and she pulled me back to second mm. guess a bit more. Cool. So I think we've become a phenomenal yin yang. Cool. And over many, many, many bad moments in our lives mm. where we've made bad decisions, lost money, lost homes, uh, lost businesses, lost contracts, we've really been able to fine tune each other and go, well, hang on a minute, that's a weakness. Let's not focus on that. Let's get someone else to do that. We're going to focus on the strengths. So over yeah. the years, we've become very good uh, with each other. What, what's and stuck you now, together, Steve? Like, like 50. Sorry. Huh? sorry, I interrupted you there. What were you saying? We're both 50 now. We've been together like 30 odd years. So, so like you've got to look at relationships out there. Again, these are conversations that we don't usually have as business owners. Fine. And we can talk great ideas. That's always fun. And how do we blow people's minds? That's super fun. But like, it, like the real heart of everyone comes to these relationships. And I just feel like, how the heck did you stay together? Was oh, it yeah. an acceptance of, of the bullshit and then a deep love for each other? Like, what was it? And I'm not coming from dating no. advice. I'm talking real shit, right? Yeah, no. And this you can take into any relationship. It's not accepting the bullshit. It's the transparency. Mm. Um, you will have, and every entrepreneur out there will have a bad day. And then you'll go home to your, your wife and your kids. Like most entrepreneurs, we work from home. So we will literally go from our little corner office. We will go to the mm -hmm. dining room table and our head is still motoring on that problem. And the whole family are looking at you going, what's wrong with dad? And you, like a freaking genius, will go, it's in the best benefit and interest of the family to not know the shit that I'm going through. But the trouble is when you adopt yes. that mentality is you actually push the family away. And you push the person that actually lays next to you at night away mm. nine times out of 10 and now 10 out of 10 for me i've noticed that when i've gone to my wife please ignore my my mood but this happened and she'll say something as deep and meaningful mm. like why did it happen how did it happen who did it happen with they really hear you what and you go well hang on a minute yeah i see hang on if i go and speak to him then i won't even have that problem I have found so many times by actually going to my wife that knows nothing about a business. Yeah. She's actually been the most intelligent person close to me. So we've learned over the years that whatever I'm going through, I unload her like a, like a tsunami mm. and we work it out together. And quite often we will have conversations around the table with the kids going, Hey, I've just been sued or I just lost this contract or this money that was supposed to come in didn't come in. What would you have done? And I've had those conversations since I love there that. seven. I love that. And I've, I love one of the other good things is um, I, I ride motorcycles, but my wife's got a car. And so when I would take the kids to school and I've got a sales meeting, I would actually schedule those calls for when I'm driving the car to school. Mm -hmm. So they can hear the entire conversation. And then when I hang up, I would literally ask kids ranging from like think? seven to 12, yeah. how did daddy do? Do you think he likes daddy? Do you think he's going to do business with me? You know, what do you think? And you'll get the kids going, yeah, daddy, he loves you. But, yeah. but there, there's no. once in a while, there's that diamond, right? Like yeah. I, I get it, man. I do the same thing. I, like we talk about sex. We talk about things that we're not allowed to talk to, but Renee and I, we've gone through a lot of bullshit in our life too. And I can yeah. relate hundred percent. Transparency is the way you've said it perfectly. I actually didn't think of it that way, but it's exactly right. But you're right, those kids, some, my 14-year-old now, I'm like, hey, hey, uh, I'm going to have the Steve Sims guy on uh, the podcast. What do you think? Like, I just, <laughs> they have a, like, everyone around you is going to give you this package. The kids don't. Like, there's they so don't. much genius in that. I love that. I'm pumped right now because it's so cool to hear. That's a shit I don't hear on the podcast, by the way. Uh, you think oh, you, there you go. You're so welcome. Great. That's good. Hey, I'm going to read a little ex, ex, expert excerpt from your book. Okay. By the way, this is my favorite part. Okay says, I know a lot of amazing, great people, but Claire is the one who has been there all the way, every step of the way, through the ups and downs and everything in between. She has continually inspired me, supported me, and loved me. 
Even when I didn't deserve it, I owe everything to my wife, Claire, and I will spend the rest of my life saying thank you. When I read that, I got to know you for real. All the other stuff, you're smarts and you're talented and you're like, you're so good at what you do. You're, you take the genius and make it simple. I could go all day. It's really great. But that's like, that's a little bit of a little bit of a keyhole into, into you. But I just want to ask you a question on that. You say you're thanking her every single day. Sorry if this is sorry if this is just not uh, the angle we were going, but or thought. But I'm just curious to see, like, how are you thanking her? And I'm not. I think a lot of people don't have these questions. I think a lot of entrepreneurs forget that. But you're thanking her every day. I'd love to hear that. So why would you not say thank you or just reassure the person that holds you up, supports you, picks you up, and loves you for you? Why would you not? Should be more the question. Um, mm. I don't wait for Valentine's, for birthday and for Christmas to tell my wife that she's the one and that I appreciate her being in my life. So we make up funny little days. We do Freaky Friday. We do Funny Tuesday. Literally, we'll have, and she started adopting it. Like last, last uh, Thursday, she had a thankful Thursday and she Come literally on. does a little card and she's like, happy thankful. And I'm like, I didn't get you anything. You know, I just, <laughs> it's this standing joke that we will just do a little, tiny little $20 nothing, gift right? yeah. uh, and nothing. Um, yeah. And uh, she, she, we do that a lot. And I will often just wake up in the morning, just hug her and thank her and kiss her yeah, and beautiful. do yeah. something. And I will also, here's a big thing for everyone out there. I schedule a lot of my week with her. Mm. So different times during the week, I like that. I, I would literally schedule breakfast. And before everyone goes, well, why the hell would you schedule breakfast? Because if you don't schedule it, you'll schedule a phone call on it. Oh, yeah, it'll be and that. then it's gone. It's so totally schedule true. the time for the most important people in your life. So I do make a point of letting her know every really day that's most important. And it's always, a, it's always work, right? It's always, a, it's always something you work on, right? It's always getting deeper, always getting better, right? And you have bad days, good that's days. That's the thing. It's it just effort, better, right? It? it does. It does. Yep. Nice. So, you know, you just got to keep, when we were younger, and of course, as they say, experience comes two seconds after you needed it most. But we've learned that the more we put into our relationship, the more we get out, the more powerful we become mm. to attack any problems or issues. You know, it, it's a phenomenal relationship. So, so I'm really big on putting, and I know you're as well, just by reading some of your stuff, is that I'm really big on not putting... Uh, you know, like cancerous style relationships around me, but on the other side of it. So everyone's talking about that. So I think we've done that. But what I'm trying to say is this, do we quit on relationships too early? Oh yeah. Uh, did you see my video on the 300 year old Oak tree? Oh, I think so I, I did. I think, I think I did. So I did just put it out. I think it went out a couple of a week ago or something okay. like that. But I put this, um, I've always asked people if they have 300 year old Oak trees in there in their uh, relationships. Now, when you meet someone, imagine that's a seed. Now that seed needs to be watered, nurtured, trimmed, pruned, fed. If you don't, it'll be squashed and it will die. That's a relationship. If you put a lot of time and energy in that seed to get it to a 300 year old oak tree, you can run a bus into it and it's still mm -hmm. gonna stay strong. So yep. you've got to look at that relationship and ask yourself first off, is this a relationship that I want to put effort into it? Is it worthwhile for me to have that relationship? And if it is, treat it like a 300-year-old oak tree and nurture it, care it, mollycoddle it, prune it, and grow that thing mm -hmm. to the point that it will be able to suffer knocks, bad weather, slander, whatever, but will still be by your side. Yeah, it's awesome, man. I love it. I love, uh, I think business should be a huge percentage of relationship communication. He, like I if think I was, it is. I mean, I think, it's exactly it, but most people aren't putting it together. To it. Yeah, more, most people more are talking strategies. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm gonna do a I'm gonna do a little lightning round. I've never done nothing like this because I'm just doing this brand new, anyways. I'm gonna shoot some questions at you. We're not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna hit you with like eight questions. This might be a complete fail, but we can edit the crap out of this thing. So, if we have to. But they're interesting questions. It's just to get to know you a little bit better, and and then afterwards we'll kind of wrap it up there, Steve. So. All right. Um. Okay, what rejuvenates you the most when you feel burn out, burnt out? Uh, seeing other people smile and happy from experiences that I've created. Just gives you life, hey? Okay, next question. If you were to ask, you were asked to create a scratch and sniff sticker. 
describe the image and the smell? Um, probably my ugly face and two stroke engine oil. <laughs> that, by the way, I think I just gave you one of your next marketing moves because that's yeah. genius. A, a stinky scratch and stiff sticker with Steve's face on it. Anyways, I'm going to make a note of that. You know what? That is actually really good. Um, okay. What is the one rule from a child, from your childhood that you don't agree with anymore? Um, stop asking questions. Stop asking questions. Ask as many <laughs> questions as you can. Great answer. If you were to have a motion picture, which I actually think probably will happen for you, who would you want to play Steve Sims in the movie? And it can't be you. It would probably have to be a drunken version of Russell Crowe. <laughs> <laughs> in his usual arrogant obnoxious self it would probably have to be him okay good um name something very popular that you feel is overrated coaches ah nice totally <laughs> so true with with a sheepish the first sheepish moment in this interview okay so we've got well, I, was, I was gonna say philip mckernan but we'll go with coaches <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see where you're going. So one coach, really. Okay. So, so if, so you're a moth, what's your flame and why does it draw it to you? Or why do you draw uh, to it? It's got to be, uh, oh, it's probably got to be, because going to the fire is the bad thing. It's probably got to be challenges. Like all entrepreneurs, I accept too many challenges. Interesting. I thought we were going to say bikes, but whatever, we'll go deep. <laughs> Next one. Uh, name an animal you most identify with and explain why you're drawn to it. Animal. Um, Did I just dump Steve Sims on the animal question? <laughs> God, I'm trying to think. Uh, it would probably have to be a Kitty? rhino. No, a rhino. <laughs> yeah, it, it nice. Plows in and doesn't think about the consequences. Probably has to be. My wife would probably definitely go, yeah, he's a rhino. Oh, that's good. And that last question in the lightning round is, is this. Favorite way to eat chocolate? Um, by the handful. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Awesome, man. Well, hey, uh, where can we find you, Steve? Uh, I know stevesims.com. Where's the first, second, and third place you want people to come see you? Well, yeah, I'm at stevedsims.com. That's 1M. Uh, but I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, same tags. Uh, on Twitter, I'm stevedsims1 you know, track me down in, in those places and come and hang out. Now, let me ask you this. You're, uh, you've got a consulting offering out there. You're, you're uh, generously putting yourself out there. I think people are going to be absolutely blown away by what you do. If you could describe the exact person or at least close to the perfect guy that you're looking for to say that is the guy that I can help, who would that be? Someone that's aggravated. Uh, someone has got to be aggravated. Uh, I don't care if they're hitting walls. I don't care if they're hitting hurdles, but I need them to be aggravated because it's aggravated oysters that make pearls. If you're comfortable being in that rut, don't contact me. Awesome, man. I wasn't expecting aggravated. That's the, that's probably the first, that's a, that's good. <laughs> you want to work with me as long as you're aggravated. So anyways, uh, we could probably talk for a long time. I truly appreciate you being uh, on, on my show. Uh, if I can help you any way, uh, you probably could help me more than I could help you, but you'd be surprised. And sure. uh, let me know, honestly. Okay.